All right, everyone. Hi, this is Shannon Von Selden, uh, Program Director of Rare Disease Legislative Advocates. Thank you to everyone for joining us today um, and taking time out of your very busy schedules. Um, I know many of you are working from home or trying to uh, homeschool your children, and um, I know that um, it takes a lot of effort to um, join a webinar um, from home, so I appreciate it. Um, everyone joining us today. Um, I just want to remind everyone that everyone's phone lines are muted. So if you um, have a question or a comment for any of the speakers, feel free to use the chat message feature on the webinar. Um, and I will definitely pass along your questions to the speaker um, during the webinar so they can be answered or, um, or a follow-up afterwards. Uh, I have some exciting news to share with you all. We actually have welcomed three new uh, staff people to the Every Life Foundation this week. Uh, so we're very excited to announce that um, Caitlin Laws has joined us as the new RDLA coordinator. Uh, Swapna Kakani has joined us as our state advocacy fellow. And Adrian Palau Tejeda has joined us as the diversity inclusion fellow. So we're very excited. Um, to have this additional support uh, for the community, um, and hopefully you all will uh, be able to work with them in the future. Um, so today, here's the agenda. Um, as you might remember, a couple of months ago, we actually had a couple of speakers talking about 21st Century Cures and Cures 2.0. So we'll have Nicholas Minetto joining us to discuss uh, the concept paper that was released a few weeks ago. Uh, Dylan Simon will be discussing updates on the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act. Kylie Barber will speak on the Medical Nutrition Equity Act. And then I have some news about Rare Across America. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you, Nick. Excellent. Thanks very much. Great Thank to you. be here today and looking forward to the discussion on Cures 2.0. And just a quick question. Do I advance? There we go. So in thinking about Cures 2.0, I thought about this time of year, and as we typically think about um, our minds move to uh, thoughts of summer, that often occurs. A, a part of that traditionally is uh, big blockbuster releases or anticipated releases from the studios, at least during normal, uh, normal circumstances and times. And, you know, thinking about Cures 2.0 as a sequel, I think, you know, one of the big questions, of course, is, Will 2.0 be a hit like its predecessor, like Cures 1.0? You know, is this going to be another Home Alone 2 or Empire Strikes Back? Or, you know, conversely, there's always that possibility that there's a bust. You know, there are some movies for every Home Alone 2. We've got Dumb and Dumberer. And for every uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, you know, you've got good old Speed 2, which I think took place on a cruise ship. So hopefully, of course, like uh, our, the leads on the bill are, and, and many are in this community are hoping that it'll be the former that Cures 2.0 will be as embraced and as impactful as its uh, 1.0 pre predecessor, given the impact that legislation has had. But, of course, um, that's the big question or one of the big questions that remains ahead. So just a brief overview of uh, Cures 1.0 or Episode 1. I know many, if not all, on this call followed that legislation and now law very closely. You know, but just a quick little recap, especially if folks are newer to the community or newer to public policy world, since it has been hard to believe almost four years now uh, that we're coming up on its anniversary date. So this was a multi-year effort that began in spring of 2014 and then culminated with the uh, bill signing in 2016 during the lame duck session of Congress that year was led like it's being led right now by uh, Congressman Upton and Congresswoman Diana DeGette. At the time, Congressman Upton was the chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee through which the legislation passed through. And, and again, he spent a couple of years working with his team and many of the members on that committee developing the legislation, conducting you know, record numbers of hearings, legislative hearings, field hearings, roundtable discussions, really getting everyone in the medical research and therapy development and related spaces involved. It was a pretty sweeping piece of legislation that focused on medical research, FDA, therapy development reforms. It also included a significant health IT title. It was the first big uh, substance use disorder response was included in the CURES package. 
and then there were and, and more beyond that. But it was a significant piece of legislation that, again, took a long time to develop, but was certainly well worth it. As noted, it was widely embraced uh, in Congress, particularly by those on the Energy and Commerce Committee who were actively engaging in multiple events, including district level roundtables and hearings and field hearings and the like. And as noted, it was enacted during the lame duck session of Congress, which I always like to note as a, a, one of the indicators of, well, you, know, you do have the possibility of having some fairly robust activity during a lame duck session. Sometimes lame duck sessions are, are bust or not much occurring during those time periods, but other times like in November and December of 2016, even with a pretty big transformation that was coming forward in early 2017, you had a lot of uh, good legislating with, I think, Cures 1 being the best example. We'll go then to the next. So just a quick recap as to sort of what's been happening in this category of Cures 2.0. So back in the fall, we had uh, Congressman Upton and Congresswoman Deget issued their call for ideas for a, a Cures 2.0. Um, and it was a little bit more targeted and focused than we had when we had Cures 1.0, which started out pretty broad. So this one, they were really, when they started their, their effort and put out a call for ideas, they focused in a couple of overarching buckets, um, including coverage and reimbursement, particularly of digital health tools, um, ultimately provisions that would accelerate Medicare coverage, the recognition that there are some challenges there, particularly in the rare disease community and on the on payment uptake and the like, and looking at ways to address them, at least in the Medicare and the CMS context. And building upon Cures 1.0, looking at um, specifically the issue of real world evidence and how some of those policies, um, including many of which were included in Cures 1.0 in the whole RWE patient engagement PFDD space, how they can be further ad advanced and accelerated. So then the comment or idea period closed um, slightly before Christmas. Um, I think four or 500 comments, four to 500 submissions were received, including I know the Every Life Foundation submitted its, its thinking. And then we had several months where it was a little quiet on this front. Of course, during a good chunk of this time, we had the uh, unfolding of the COVID-19 pandemic, which, which of course resulted in many, if not most members focusing almost exclusively on that issue. But in late April, just a few weeks back, as Shannon mentioned, um, Upton and Deget did issue a 12-page uh, concept paper for Cures 2.0, which gets to a little more detail, building upon the items that they identified in their call for proposals, but gets to a little bit more specificity and some of their thinking as to um, where this could go in terms of next steps. So, of course, the big question, you know, what's in Cures 2.0? And I, I know many of you have gone through this already and are, are probably deeply expert in many of these provisions that you were already talking about and, and advocating for their inclusion. But I'll do a quick rundown, again, just for those folks who maybe haven't been as engaged on Cures 2.0 to level set what we've been seeing so far. So it's a multi-prong or multi-title bill, the first of which is focused on public health issues, including, as you'll see here, issues around the COVID response um, obviously, that's been the issue du jour, continues to be a dominant topic on Capitol Hill, and this is a good example of an amendment that, you know, when they put out their concept call back in fall of 2018, you know, no one was saying the word coronavirus, no one was saying COVID-19, but this is a good example of them pivoting to address the situation and make, uh, you know, look for opportunities in Cures 2.0 that would relate to the pandemic. I think all of us were excited to see that there was a recognition of the particular challenges that rare disease families and patients face by their calling out a looking at this, this topic, specifically looking at ways to address expenditures associated with um, the cost for of, of, of pandemic and for rare on rare disease patients and families. So that was, I think, a really solid recognition and one upon which, you know, there we hopefully will be able to build out some further provisions of interest to the rare disease community. He has some grant programs here that they're talking about including, as well as another topic that's gotten a lot of interest lately, looking at incentives and process reforms to develop new um, antibiotic products, as well as um, ever efforts to make sure there's a widespread education and awareness about the benefits of vaccination, especially given the long-term hope here will be uh, having one or more vaccines developed that could then be used to address uh, to ultimately get us to a point where we can resume uh, some level of normalcy. 
So good recognition of many of the issues that Congress has been talking about in the COVID context, and great, again, to see the recognition of the rare disease challenges in this heading. So uh, section two focuses on caregiver integration, and this was an interesting topic, uh, again, of concern to many in our community and others, We're talking about a grant program to train caregivers to help support um, in-home delivery of care. This has been a topic that I know has been out on the radar for a long time, particularly given the, the challenges um, in, in multiple communities and thinking about both rare disease as well as communities like the Alzheimer's and dementia community, where we know there's sizable costs associated with institutional care. And here it sounds like they're thinking about some models that, are, that exist that are potentially able to provide the right training, right level of training for caregivers to enable them to provide more in-home care for loved ones impacted with a variety of conditions, which often addresses family desire to, to be at home as well as certainly has a fiscal impact considering that oftentimes, as, as you all know, it's Medicaid that pays a, a good chunk of these institutional care costs. Then we have patient, um, Title III is another exciting topic for us, especially given work that was done in Cures 1.0 where you're talking about deepening the role of the patient in overall healthcare decision-making. So it's a fairly high-level topic here that talks about CMS basically doing a solicitation for feedback but it's encouraging, in my view, to see a recognition of patient engagement. Um, we, we know it, of course, from all the work that's been done in the PFDD, patient engagement, patient-focused drug development space, which has been almost, you know, fo mostly focused at the FDA. But I think it's encouraging here that they're talking about patient engagement more broadly and ways to support that. So we'll go on to the next bucket, um, which is, again, also of interest to many on, on this call. I'm assuming clinical trials reform. Um, again, a topic that was in cures to, to some level, but that they're looking to build upon and I think get to some of the points that perhaps have been underlooked or overlooked. Um, a big chunk of what they're talking about is focused on uh, clinical trials diversity, enhancing clinical trials diversity, including ways to get you know, FDA engaged on this topic, looking at broader education and awareness about the value of clinical trials. And also, I think importantly, this provision here about providing making sure that Medicaid coverage supports um, beneficiaries on Medicaid helps them access clinical trials. So that's, that's been a point of concern that I've, I've heard from various stakeholders about the challenges that are out there when it comes to accessing your, your routine medical care. And it looks like they're thinking about ways to address that in this context in the, in the Medicaid program. And then it also talks about another opportunity for many on this call it could be a stakeholder process, a task force looking at making clinicaltrials.gov more user-friendly. Uh, we've all heard a lot of the criticism about the, the clunky nature of the, of the database and ways to make it a little bit more user-friendly, particularly for lay audiences. And then you're also talking about relatedly, I mentioned Medicaid coverage before, but they're also looking at the Medicare barriers here to look about, make sure that the program and the benefit can cover um, the medical care needed for participants in clinical trials. So there's not a situation where folks can't access certain care uh, through the clinical trials process, just ways to maybe make it less burdensome and less challenging for people to participate in, in trials. And then we've got Title V, which focuses on a number of FDA reforms that I've listed out here. Um, like I mentioned, the concept paper that was issued in October talked about digital health, so you're seeing a recognition of that here, looking at more cross-center engagement and coordination, some guidances on a variety of topics under the digital health space, and looking at ways for better coordination or harmonization of policy between FDA and foreign regulators when it comes to digital health. Also, interestingly, again, for us, I think you're, you're seeing some good um, indicators here around you know, grants or funding opportunities to support um, innovative cl clinical trials designs, as well as more PFDD activity, which again, a number of you have been engaged in over the years. I think it's a really good sign that Congress is recognizing the importance of not just having PFDD remain, but also looking at ways to nurture that forward um, in a number of different ways. And I think a grant program is, a, is an exciting possibility. Then you're talking again about more guidances here, and then also ways to, to strengthen the engagement between FDA and CMS, particularly when it comes to uh, a product that receives a breakthrough designation. And again, this reflects some of those concerns that are out there around the slow uptake or the 
bureaucracy that sometimes impedes the ability to actually get access to a product that is approved by FDA or a therapy that is approved by FDA, given our very divided uh, system here in terms of coding, coverage, payment, and how that, you know, is not well connected into the review and approval process. And then going on on a couple more provisions here on the next slide, there we go. Relatedly, some additional provisions here around um, ways to further modernize and update um, update CMS. They're kind of putting this as a, another area where they're not really well defined yet. They actually pose a number of questions for stakeholders to continue engaging on and to provide additional thoughts for the offices on. And I think it was encouraging to see among the list of topics here, references to gene and cell-based therapies and also therapies for small populations, so which again, I think is incredibly important for the rare disease community and ways to further cover uh, breakthrough products. So this is again, a good example of how I think they're, they're sort of flying the plane or building the plane while flying it since it's not a fully baked piece of legislation by any stretch and you're seeing some areas that seemingly are pretty well defined and other areas that I think are a little bit more amorphous where they have a sense as to high level topics or themes that they want to include, but they're looking for additional inputs from experts like all of you on the call to help further shape. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so then if that's within the cures, we'll move ahead to just a couple quick points on where, where things may go next, recognizing again that the world is pretty fluid as all of you know, given where Congress is and the, the, largely, the, the focus being still largely on the pandemic response, yet at least in my view, a little bit of a, a encouraging sign that you're seeing some level of, of interest, you're kind of resuming a discussion on topics that have been uh, put down the back burner because of COVID. And I think the Cures 2.0 concept release is a good example of an effort by lawmakers to return to some other important topics that unfortunately um, haven't gotten much attention this winter and spring because of the pandemic. So, like I said, they're continuing to engage, the leads are continuing to engage with stakeholders. They have some air, open areas of question and, and desire for further comment and feedback. You know, we've seen the offices be very open to further engagement. They seem hungry for ideas that are fit within their categories, ways to further refine and build out um, their thinking and help them move this forward. It seems like you know, there has been a near-term emphasis on some of the COVID-related provisions. Um, with the you know, likelihood or potential likelihood that you're going to see some of the other provisions shift to a greater focus for the, the next Congress, which will begin in January. And it's interesting because you're seeing some of the discussion around a similar scenario or, or calendar or pathway like we saw with Cures 1.0, which if you recall correctly, Cures 1.0 was enacted in late 2016, and that was the year before the uh, next user fee came due Padufa, um, Padufa 6 at that time, sorry, a little typo here, not Padufa 4. Um, and then there's some speculation as could we see a similar model here where, you know, instead of, you know, some thinking that maybe you would jam these two together and ultimately Cures 2.0 would fold into a Padufa 7, where perhaps we'll see a Cures 2.0 in 2021, and then that really proceed and lay a foundation for the next user fee package, which is due in 2022. And then looking at, you know, the, the handicapping here, and again, recognizing all this is very fluid, certainly there are a lot of positives associated with this effort, given the how widely embraced Cures 1 was. Again, just hard to imagine anything in recent times that has enjoyed such strong bipartisan support, both in the Congress as well as the large uh, backing from so many across the healthcare sector, when you really think about, again, how many entities engaged constructively on that. Um, during the roundtables, the hearings, and actively working on many of the provisions that were included. And I think the more targeted effort here <clears throat> um, helps with a set up a justification for a focus. So it's not saying let's go back and do a bill that's as large and grand as Cures 1.0. They've thought about this in a way that I think makes sense in terms of saying, look, Cures 1 was great, but there are a lot of gaps, a lot of other challenges that remain that Cures did not do or that maybe Cures spoke to and addressed, but now we need to revisit and look at uh, in, in another context. So I think that that more targeted effort does make sense in terms of selling and messaging the piece of legislation. Of course, there are some challenges and some on the on the on the con side, you know, one is that we don't have the committee current committee chairman sitting chairman um, leading the effort. You know, Congressman Upton, of course, is still in Congress and a very well regarded, highly regarded member. And I'm glad that he's, you know, re 
engaging on, on Cures 2.0, but it won't be that same push that's coming from the chairman, and you're not seeing this as that same leadership emphasis that we saw uh, back at, in with Cures 1.0. Obviously, we've got a challenging time frame in this near-term window, given even more so with the, the focus on, on the pandemic and then the pivot to the um, election season. And, you know, obviously there's, there's a larger set of issues out there in the um, drug cost, drug pricing, drug access space that, that could dampen some enthusiasm for taking up a bill like Cures 2.0 because it could potentially open doors to, to other legislative items. So there are some challenges out there, but there are a lot of positives. And I think at the end of the day, it's optimistic. It's encouraging to see that the offices are reengaging moving forward. And you know they've done it once before, and it's a great pairing that uh, I think is well up to the challenge of doing something again in, in the Cures 2.0 space. So I think just final takeaways here for the the rare disease community. I think again it's encouraging to see uh, the inclusion of rare disease community issues specifically in that first title and the public health title, including in that COVID context. Also, a lot of other related points here that if they're not exclusive to rare disease, they have a significant impact in our community. As I mentioned, items like further developing PFDD and real world evidence, certainly that reference to small populations, I think is a very, is a positive for us that we can build upon, focusing on clinical trials reforms and needs in that space. And I think ultimately moving into more of an access and coverage focus than we saw with Cures 1.0. All this I think speaks well for, um, for the rare disease community to be actively engaged in the Cures 2.0 process going forward. And I think there are opportunities here to help the offices uh, refine it further, build it out further, and ultimately help build the support to drive this legislation. You know, it won't happen if Congress isn't excited about it. Our community, this community, and other patient groups were a large reason why it was so successful four years ago. So that opportunity and need will be there again right now and into the coming weeks and months ahead. And thanks Wonderful. very much. Thank you, for... Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, that was very informative. And who knew you had such vast movie knowledge? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you so much. I appreciate um, you sharing all of that with, uh, with our advocates and community. Um, I'm going to pass it along to Dylan, who's going to give us an update on Newborn Screening Safe Lives Act. Uh, great. Uh, so just a little bit of background on newborn screening. Uh, so newborn screening is a public health program that centers around testing uh, all babies on the first days of life about certain disorders uh, and conditions that hinder normal development. Uh, so approximately one in 300 newborns uh, are identified with conditions through newborn screening. And this early detection allows for early treatment, which helps to prevent intellectual and physical disabilities uh, from progressing. Uh, in addition, early detection is known to not only save lives, but save costs from the overall healthcare system uh, by avoiding unnecessary costs with this timely diagnosis. Next slide, please. And so a little background on how exactly these diseases are uh, decided to be screened for. Uh, there is what's known as the, the Recommended Uniform Screening Panel, or the RUSP, is a list, a, a list of disorders from HHS that recommends to the states uh, which disorders should be on their state newborn screening panels. Uh, the key word in there uh, is recommended. Uh, states are the ones who make the final decision on which disorders are on their newborn screening panel, uh, but they heavily rely on this federal RUSP. Uh, and disorders are added to the RUSP based on evidence that supports the potential benefit of the screening, the ability for states to screen for the disorder, as well as availability for effective treatments. Uh, and there are currently 35 core conditions on the RUSP. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit of background on the legislation itself. Uh, prior to 2008, there, had, there was minimal uh, federal newborn screening programs. Uh, and so in 2008, the Congress passed the original Newborn Screening Phase Lives Act, which established national newborn screening guidelines, as well as helped to facil facilitate uh, comprehensive newborn screening in every state. Uh, this act was first reauthorized in 2014. And as you can see prior to this act, the number of, quali the number of quality newborn screening tests were varied greatly, as seen by in 2007, 
uh, only 10 states uh, in addition to DC require infant to be screened for all these recommended disorders. Uh, currently, uh, there are 50 states as well as DC that require screening for at least 31 of these 35 rush conditions. Uh, and there are approximately six states that screen for all 35, and that number is increasing uh, annually. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of a legislative timeline on the current bill. Uh, so back in May 2019, so a year ago, uh, Congresswoman Roba Allard, as well as Congressman Mike Simpson, uh, introduced the Newborn Screening Save Lives Reauthorization Act. Uh, and this bill uh, reauthorized HRSA grants, uh, which would enable, which helps to enable states to expand and improve their screening programs, as well as education to both parents and healthcare providers, and to improve follow up care for infants uh, with detect detected conditions. Uh, in addition, it reauthorized the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Heredal Disorders in Newborns and Children. Uh, and this is a committee that provides the recommendations for the federal RUSP. Uh, in addition, it directed the National Academy of Medicine to conduct a study on how to modernize the newborn screening program. Uh, as I stated earlier, the federal, the federal program and federal guidelines is, is still relatively new, uh, and this National Academy study really provides an opportunity to kind of take stock of, of where the federal newborn screening and state newborn screening program has moved in the past decade since the original passage and, and ways that we can continue to modernize the program uh, so that we can continue to improve the program moving forward. Uh, in addition, it also the, in addition, the, um, my apologies, uh, it helped to increase authorized funding levels for these programs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as of just an overall timeline on kind of where this bill has moved, following introduction, uh, last summer in June, July, you, we did see a subcommittee hearing on this where Dr. Bucchini, who is a former chair of the advisory committee, was able to testify. Uh, the bill was passed out of committee uh, as of last July. Around then, the Senate did introduce their own version of the bill, led by Senators Maggie Hassan and Cory Gardner, uh, and we'll get back to the Senate version momentarily. Uh, but then July 24th of last year, uh, with 42 cool sponsors finally on the bill, uh, the House did pass the bill by a, by a voice, voice vote, uh, which we're really excited about. Um, next slide, please. But unfortunately, uh, due to the Senate not passing the bill, authorization for federal support of these programs has expired as of September 30th of 2019. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit of background on where we are currently. Um, so as I stated, there are multiple provisions within that bill, one of which was the advisory committee. Uh, fortunately, the advisory committee was reopened as of March 20th uh, this year. From October 1st to March 20th, the advisory committee wasn't sitting, uh, which was limiting the ability to add new diseases to the federal RUS, uh, which is the key part of their work. But in addition, they do other work as well, which they were unable to perform in that time. Uh, and this was done. Uh, Due to Secretary Azar use authority, use his own authority to establish the advisory committee as a discretionary advisory committee, which allows the work of the committee to resume, including reviewing conditions for addition to the federal RUSP. Uh, the committee was authorized for two years, which is a standard dis for discretionary advisory committee. Uh, and my apologies for a mistake at the bottom of this slide. Uh, the advisory committee had planned a webinar uh, for last Friday. Unfortunately, uh, they postponed it at this time, but they are still planning to hold webinar meetings in the near future. Uh, and as those details are determined, we will be sure to inform the RDLA community. Uh, next slide, please. In addition, um, there is program funding has been, is, has continued into the FY20 budget. So both the CDC's newborn screening quality assurance program, as well as the HRSA's uh, newborn screening program was, did receive funding in the FY20 budget uh, with, with including increases over the FY19 budget. Uh, a key part that I would like to make here is that after these two slides, it'd be fair to ask, these programs have been reauthorized, the funding has continued, why do we need the Reauthorization Act? And I, I think it's a key point to make is that just continuing the status quo is more, is, is not what we're looking for. The reauthorization was there to help improve the newborn screening program 
And it did that through improving the HRSA grants, improving the CDC quality assurance program, improving the advisory committee. And all those improvements are on hold until we're able to pass the, pass the legislation or through other avenues. And so while we're very excited that these programs maintain their funding as the advisory committee is finally sitting uh, and can add conditions to the rough uh, as nominations begin to come in, uh, it is still extremely important for us to try and pass this legislation so we can continue to improve the newborn screening program. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit on the Senate bill. Uh, as you may have noticed, I briefly touched on it and then kept going and there was a reason. Uh, so the Senate bill is where we're having uh, a lot of our issues. So the Senate Health Committee has yet to hold a mark above the bill. Uh, this is due to a proposed amendment from Senator Rand Paul that would push to change the bill that would require parents to opt in to allow the newborn's unidentified blood spots to be used for research. Uh, this would create a huge burden for the program. It's important to note that these dried blood spots are stripped of identifying information, uh, and then laboratory staff and approved researchers use these re residual dried blood spots to improve screening tests for existing conditions. Uh, in addition, it all, these dried blood spots also help with research to develop diagnostics and treatments for conditions not yet added to these state newborn screening panels. Um, next slide, please. So just a little bit of background on this informed consent amendment and the issues surrounding it. Uh, so a little bit on the research side, as I stated previously, uh, the current newborn screening test would be affected. Uh, it's estimated that scientists require anywhere between three and 10,000 unique samples to probably test the range of these tests. Um, what, what, that, what those samples are needed for specifically is to ensure that the machines that test these samples uh, are still working properly. They need to ensure this is, ensures that the false positive and false negative rates remain low, and we need require these samples uh, to ensure those machines are working properly. In addition, uh, more than 70% of the research published using these dried blood spots use these samples to develop new tools and treatments for disease not yet on the rust. And so it would halt the research in, kind of in its tracks while the, we, the research can learn to work around it um, due to it would inhibit the ability to conduct this research, to develop the new treatments, develop new diagnostics, so that we can grow that number of 35 conditions on the rust and, and continue to see newborn screening grow uh, around the country. Uh, in addition, uh, we know the effect of informed consent on the state level. Uh, during a California pilot study, researchers were required to obtain informed consent. In that study, uh, only 52% of newborns were invited to participate in that study. However, that was due primarily due to hospital burden, not lack of consent. 90% uh, of parents who were asked consented to participate, uh, which indicates a willingness to, to allow for con consent for these research from parents. The issue was that too often hospitals did not participate or asking at low levels uh, parents to consent due to the increased burden of asking for informed consent. And in addition, uh, previous government action on this issue, uh, 2015, the HHS Secretary's Advisory Committee on hum Human Research Protection acknowledged this burden uh, on the research. And so the government has already discussed that they know that this burden exists. Uh, and so this informed consent amendment would truly harm rare disease research and truly harm newborn screening. Uh, and that is why ourselves, as well as the patient uh, advocacy community has generally been opposed to this amendment. Uh, and we are still hoping that we can pass this bill uh, without the amendment attached. Uh, next, bill. next slide, please. Uh, so next steps. Uh, so as we're, as today we're preparing for when Congress kind of returns to session in full, uh, they are back now, uh, but as Nick stated, they're primarily focusing on uh, COVID-19. Uh, so we have worked with the March of Dimes Coalition to prepare a new set of fact sheets uh, that brings together all this information to ensure that Hill officers are probably educated on the issue. Uh, in addition, we continue to work with the Senate Health Committee to uh, determine what an equitable compromise would be uh, with the funding in place, with for Hearst and CDC, as well as opening uh, the advisory committee. Uh, we believe there's no need to compromise on the bill uh, that will damage the future of newborn screening. Uh, in addition, uh, we want to continue to support grassroots advocacy, uh, calling out advocates to call and email Senator Paul 
as well as Chairman Lamar Alexander's office to voice support of the bill without the informed consent amendment. Uh, in addition, uh, we are examining all policy options. Uh, there are definitely opportunities to advance revisions, including the updated language through administrative action, appropriation report language, or public-private partnerships. So we're definitely looking at all avenues to continue to improve the newborn screening program, uh, including passing the original legislation uh, that does not include the informed consent amendment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so for more information, uh, rarescreening.org is a great place to go. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me at the email on this slide. Uh, thanks so much. Hope everyone has a great day. Hey, Dylan, we have a couple of questions um, from our yep. listeners. Um, one being, um, what's the probability of the parental consent piece remaining in the bill? Mm. I would not want to put a number on it. Uh, <laughs> I would say the amendment, the, I would say this, this amendment was originally proposed uh, back in September, um, and we have been at stalemate ever since. Uh, so I, I would say there's a, we are working hard to get it off, would be my comment, uh, but there's, it is still around, so there's obviously still a chance that it's included, but we're working very hard uh, with our patient advocacy as well as industry partners to to take that to ensure that language is not included in the final bill. Great. And then someone asked about um, working with Rand Paul's office. Is anyone in particular working with Rand Paul's office? Is there a particular organization that's kind of spearheading that? In terms of speaking directly to Senator Paul's office, I am not aware. Uh, the coalition, the March of Dimes Coalition, has been focused mainly on speaking uh, with the Senate Health Committee and Chairman Alexander's office, um, and the March. So that March of Dimes Co Coalition, which we are uh, a member of, has been focusing our attention uh, with there as well as other champions uh, on the Senate and House side. In terms of any one organization primarily focused on Senator Paul's office, uh, none come to mind at the moment. Great. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot. No, no problem. Thank you, Dylan. I'm going to pass it on to Kylie um, to talk about the Medical Nutrition Equity Act. You there, Kylie? Shannon, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so, my name is Kylie Barber, and I am the um, Medical Food Policy Fellow with the National PKU Alliance, as well as the Every Life Foundation. And I'm here to talk about the medical food bill and give a little information about um, the PKU. Um, so, PKU is a type of inborn error of metabolism that is characterized by the inability to properly metabolize protein. And so, what happens in the body um, is toxic levels of fee accumulate in the blood and brain, causing irreversible brain damage. Children suffer intellectual disability and abnormal developmental outcomes. Um, adults suffer significant neurological deterioration and severe mental health issues such as anxiety and depression. Um, and this is caused when someone consumes a normal diet of protein um, that has an amino acid called phi. Um, and phi is found in most everyday foods, including meats, breads, and pastas, and even fruits and vegetables. Um, so the treatment for PKU is what's called medical nutrition, which includes a daily specialized formula and low protein modified foods and is a standard of care and is the standard of care therapy for PKU and other IEM um, and is essential to preventing the negative health outcomes. Next slide. Okay, so medical foods are designed for patients with limited or impaired capacity to ingest, digest, absorb, or metabolize ordinary foods or nutrients, um, whereby dietary management cannot be achieved by modification of the normal diet alone. 
They come in multiple forms and are designed to provide age-appropriate options for patients, including condition-specific infant formulas. Medical foods fall into three categories. Um, the first are products in powder form um, or ready-to-drink products that are devoid of the offending nutrients but are otherwise nutritionally complete. Um, second, there are modular products that are not nutritionally complete, but serve to provide a component of the diet that is devoid of the offending nutrients, such as amino acid mixtures, um, low volume products, and tablets. And then lastly, we have foods modified to be low in protein, such as baked goods, pastas, meats, and cheese substitutes that provide the needed calories and satiety. Um, next slide. So the out-of-pocket cost for medical foods depends on the individual's age, the disorder, and their insurance coverage status. Um, the estimated annual cost for treating a person with an inborn error of metabolism like PKU ranges from $2,000, um, just over $2,000 for an infant to almost $25,000 for a man or a pregnant woman. Uh, the products vary in cost, obviously, depending on the amount needed and the type of condition being treated. But for PKU, formula typically ranges between $300 to over $500 per six case um, container. And to put that in perspective for you, um, some uh, school-age child um, through a teenager, you know, young adult can go through a canister of formula about every day and a half or so. So it adds up really, really quickly. Um, and then, the second component of the PKU diet are what's called, again, low protein modified foods, and those can cost up to eight times the cost of normal food. And I've provided um, uh, some numbers on the bottom of this uh, slide, so you can sort of put that in perspective. Um, so medical foods are not available in retail stores, and their shipping and handling costs can be as high as $50, so there's an additional cost on top. Um, so the issue is, up until about 1972, medical foods were regulated as drugs by the FDA. Um, manufacturers were subject to the onerous, onerous requirements that are extremely time-consuming and cost-restrictive, um, which choked the life out of medical food product innovation. So in 1972, the FDA reclassified these products to foods for special dietary use to enhance their development and availability. Um, so because medical foods are regulated as foods and not drugs, they may be referred to over the or referred to as over the counter. However, in most cases, authorization is required by the pharmacy um, or the company or organization that's dispensing the product um, in order to demonstrate that this is being supervised by a medical provider. So as of 2016, 35 states have actually passed legislative mandates for state or private payer, payer coverage of these medical foods. Um, such coverage is mandated on a state-by-state -state basis <clears throat> and does not apply to those who are self-insured or where state law is not applicable, for, for example, federal plans like ERISA. Um, in addition, there is a wide variability in coverage from state to state. Um, payment for medical foods may actually occur through state programs like Medicaid, CHIP, and SNAP. Um, coverage can also occur through TRICARE for military and family. Um, next slide. Okay, so the Medical Nutrition Equity Act is a bill to provide for the coverage of medically necessary food and vitamins and individual amino acids for digestive and inherited metabolic disorders under federal health programs and private health insurance. Um, so we have two bills which is very exciting. Um, so the House bill currently has 62 co-sponsors and we are anticipating to see more, um, namely Lucy McBath from Georgia and Gus Bilirakis from Florida um, have agreed to support. Um, Senator Ernst has agreed to be the Senate Republican lead, which is very exciting. The Senate bill, uh, 3657 was introduced in the Senate by Senators Casey and Ernst on May 7th. Next slide, please. Okay, so the National PKU Alliance co-hosted a PKU advocacy webinar with the National PKU News on Wednesday, 
May 13th, where we discuss how to share your story, how to reach out and promote the Medical and Nutrition Equity Act through your local media, media channels. And we also provide a general, a general overview of grassroots advocacy strategies. And if anyone was unable to attend that webinar but would like to receive a copy of the recording, you can go ahead and send me an email and I can get you a copy of the recording. Um, patients and providers for the Medical Nutrition Equity Coalition um, actually held a Hill Day, a virtual Hill Day, just this past Tuesday, the 19th, with government relations staff. And we asked grad, grassroots advocates to contact their members of Congress, um, asking them to co-sponsor the Medical Nutrition Equity Act. Advocates also were asked to share their medical food story on the coalition website, tweet their members of Congress, and record a video telling members of Congress why this legislation matters. We had a total of 217 advocates who took 227 actions and reached uh, 203 members of Congress. Um, so our priority continues to be building as much co-sponsor support by way of co-sponsors on both bills. Um, so we ask that advocates please go to a coalition website, nutritionequity.org, to send a quick message to both senators and representatives to co-sponsor this critical legislation. Um, we also want to encourage advocates to sign up for Rare Across America um, through our DLA and to advocate for the Medical Nutrition Equity Act close to home. Um, and that is it. Great. Kylie, I actually have a couple of questions um, for you from others. Um, one is whether um, this, the Medical Nutrition Equity Act would cover severe food allergies. And the other would be whether it would cover low sodium foods for cardiac patients. Yeah, so those are really good questions. And you can find the list of conditions on the coalition website. Um, there is a list of, I believe, 33 conditions. So you will have to double check to see which specific condition um, you have in mind. OK, great. They can go to nutritionequity.org and find the list. Perfect, thank you. All right, thanks, Kylie. Um, we're going to go ahead. I am going to just talk a little bit about Rare Across America. Um, last year in 2019, we had over 600 advocates um, attend over 300 meetings in their district and state offices during Rare Across America. And these are just a few of pictures from those meetings from last summer. We are very excited to, um, to uh, um, have more meetings this summer for Rare Across America during the August Congressional Recess. Um, if you ha have not heard about Rare Across America yet, uh, it's a great opportunity for veteran or new advocates to meet with their members of Congress, their representatives and senators closer to home in the local district and state offices when those members are already home um, for the month of August. And um, we make it as easy as possible for our advocates to participate by um, we schedule the meetings for you um, in the district offices and you can attend one meeting, two meetings or three meetings, um, however um, you see fit um, given your time constraints. Um, but this is a really great opportunity um, for those who aren't able to travel to Washington, D.C. during the year, especially now when um, really no one is traveling right now um, to meet with your members and um, a great way to start relationships with your legislators. Um, if you have never met with your legislators before, this is a really easy way to do it. Um, we do webinars to train you ahead of time and schedule the meetings for you and um, provide you with any materials that you need during the meetings. Um, and it's also a great way for advocates who are already have relationships with their members or have already met with their representative and senators before. For instance, during Rare Disease Week in February, if you were here in Washington, D.C., um, this is a great way to follow up on those meetings that you already had in February and um, uh, let your legislators know um, whether they actually fulfilled your asks or not. And, to remind them how they can support you in the rare disease community. So registration for Rare Across America is open now, and you can find our registration page at 
www.americaamerica.org, and it will be open until July 3rd. I don't want to um, not mention that um, we also do have abilities to turn these meetings into virtual meetings. So if, um, if need be in August, if um, offices are not doing in-person meetings, um, we have the abilities to do conference calls or Zoom meetings instead. Um, so we will be communicating that information um, once we start scheduling the meetings and hearing back from offices. And um, we'll definitely be um, communicating that to everyone. Uh, but you can mark your calendars um, for these impor important dates. Uh, July 9th, we'll hold an informational webinar, uh, and this is where you'll get information on the scheduling of your meetings, what to expect during your meetings, and um, what the suggested legislative acts will be during Rare Across America. And then new this year, we're planning on July 14th to hold a social media webinar, and this will just help um, you learn more about how you can utilize social media during Rare Across America and your advocacy, um, and some tips and tricks, um, especially if you do end up having conference calls or Zoom meetings, um, how you can use social media um, to, um, to um, make those touches even um, more impactful. And then the meetings will take place between August 3rd and September 6th um, during the summer recess. Um, and you can find more information on our website at rareacrossamerica.org. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to me, Shannon, at my email address, esbonfelden at everylifefoundation.org. If you have any questions about registration or the process, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, we're really looking forward to having um, hundreds of advocates meeting with their members this summer. Um, I think it will be really impactful and important, um, a really important time to do so. So um, you can also save the date for our next monthly webinar. We will have the next one on June 18th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. And as always, um, if you have a particular topic or legislation or policy that you're interested in learning more about, um, please don't hesitate to let me know. Um, Nick did a fantastic job today um, talking more about the CURES 2.0 concept paper, um, and we'll get more great speakers for June. But if you have any ideas, um, or something that you um, or your organization is working on, if you would like to present on anything, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me about that as well. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us today, and thank you to our sponsors for this month's webinar. Uh, we appreciate everyone joining us today, and um, please don't hesitate to reach out to anyone at the Every Life Foundation if we can um, be of any help and support to you during this time. Uh, thank you so much, and have a wonderful day to everyone. Take care. Bye.